think we're going to get started. Um, welcome to a FAMRI lecture that stands for the Flight Attendants Medical Research Institute. And we have a FAMRI Center of Excellence here at Hopkins. Uh, and it's a collaboration with um, the School of Medicine and School of Public Health. Um, we've got lots of investigators working on this. And the FAMRI Center of Excellence was uh, set up um, because flight attendants were suffering from exposure to secondhand smoke on airplanes and ended up suing tobacco companies for not disclosing the harmful effects of secondhand smoke. And um, the companies settled in advance because they, I think, could see that the judgments were going to be huge. So part of the settlement was setting up a research institute to better understand um, the impacts of secondhand smoke. So we're very honored to have a family center of excellence here at Hopkins. And we're delighted delighted to have uh, Dr. Tom Susson here to give us a lecture today. So let me just say a couple words about him. Um, he did his PhD here at Hopkins in biochemistry, cell and molecular biology, and then did a postdoc in environmental health sciences, and um, is now an assistant scientist in the Department of uh, Environmental Health Sciences. His interests are in environmental exposures, and particularly <coughs> cigarette smoke, um, interested in issues of oxidative stress and inflammation, immune dysfunction, and cellular damage uh, to the lungs caused by um, these types of exposures. So he does a lot of work with mouse models, um, with cigarette smoke as one of the exposures that he looks at. And today he's going to be talking about some work that has gotten a lot of press recently um, around exposure to um, vapor from <coughs> e-cigarettes. So I'm going to hand it over to you. And I know that many of you will have questions, so we'll try and leave uh, a bit of time uh, at the end for questions. So welcome and thank you. All right, thank you. OK. <laughs> So e-cigarettes are a uh, very hot topic right now, hotly debated. Um, there is a large group of people who say that these are the greatest inventions since sliced bread. Uh, there are equal number of individuals on the other side who say that these have the potential to destroy the galaxy. So, uh, so I think we're going to talk not just about the, the small study that I published, but I plan to kind of present an overview and bring everybody up to speed on what is really at the heart of this, this issue. Uh, and so some examples that highlight the, the debate uh, on the evil side, perhaps, uh, the World Health Organization, American Heart Association, have both issued concerns that uh, e-cigarettes could perhaps undo decades worth of work to rid uh, the, the world of tobacco and are once again making smoking culturally acceptable. Uh, WHO has also urged governments to ban the sale as well as use in public places. Uh, and some countries have heeded that ban. Uh, for example, Argentina, Brazil, Singapore, Norway, um, maybe some others uh, have banned them outright. Uh, there's also, here's a statement from an FDA spokesperson showing, uh, saying we are concerned about the potential for addiction and abuse of these products and we don't want the public to perceive them as a safer alternative to cigarettes. Uh, however, on the opposite side, there are many advocates for e-cigarettes who say that uh, these fulfill the sensation and satisfaction of smoking without exposing the user or the bystanders to uh, harmful levels of carcinogens and other dangerous chemicals associated with tobacco. Uh, below is a statement from a survey that we're currently conducting. Uh, there's a spot at the bottom where you can write in responses. And so we receive a lot of responses like this. Uh, you can just, just focus on the bottom last sentence. Definitely was a life changer for me health-wise and financially. Also having published a paper two months ago in an open access journal, I receive two or three emails a day from people like this who say that, that these were life changers and how dare I uh, say anything about e-cigarettes that could paint them in a negative light. So, um, so there's a lot of issues here and I'm going to try to cover as many topics as I can in the next 45 minutes, um, such as what are e-cigarettes, how are they marketed, who is using them, 
as well as review some of the health effects studies, one of which is our own, uh, and then conclude with some perhaps FDA regulations. Uh, so what are e-cigarettes? Well, they are battery-powered devices that deliver vaporized nicotine, chemicals, other flavorings. However, they do not contain nicotine. They do not require combustion. The first generation of e-cigs in the top right uh, look like cigarettes. They're often referred to as cig uh, They contain a cartridge which is disposable, and that uh, cartridge contains uh, the e-liquids. Once that's used up, you dispose it and replace it. Um, however, the second generation of e-cigs are the uh, vape pens or the tank style e-cigarettes. Those have become more popular uh, because you can refill them, you can put whatever liquids you want in them, um, and those are increasingly becoming more popular. Uh, at the top of the food chain for e-cigarettes, at the bottom are the mod devices or the personal uh, vaporizers. They look a lot like the tank style vaporizers. Uh, but they have added controls that allow you to customize the exposure, such as altering the voltage and wattage uh, for your own personal uh, taste. Um, in addition to those, there are e-cigars, uh, there's e-pipes, e-hookahs, e-marijuana, um, and there's new innovations coming out practically every month. Um, additionally, there's a movement away from these boring, mass-produced looking vape pens towards things that look like works of art. Uh, so there's a more artisan approach that's being taken now. And in many respects, the vape pen that you use is a reflection of your personality. Uh, so there's appeal there as well. Also, these appeal to kind of the hobbyist in everyone. Uh, you can take them apart. You can add in new filaments, et cetera. And, uh, there's, there's a lot of people who are attracted to them simply for the, the hobby nature of them. Um, so how do they work? Well, regardless of whether you're using a SIG alike or a vape pen, they all contain a battery. The battery is activated by either a pressure sensor or a button. Uh, and once activated, that heats up a coil, a heating coil. And uh, that coil is wrapped around a wick. And so that wick wicks away the liquid from either the tank on the right or uh, oops, either the, the tank on the right or uh, or in the case of a sig alike there's this cartridge which contains this polyfill absorbent material uh, which is uh, which is wicked, where the liquid is contained and, and the wick wicks away from from this liquid here so what are the liquids uh, the primary ingredients, which constitute 80 to 90 percent, are some combination of propylene glycol and glycerin. Um, these are the ingredients that produce the actual vapor and form the base of the liquid that carry the other ingredients. And so this is what synthesizes the sense of, uh, of smoke. Um, the other ingredients are nicotine. Not all liquids contain nicotine, but most do. Uh, generally, they contain perhaps a little bit less nicotine than what you would expect to find in a cigarette, um, but they can contain comparable levels or even higher. And in some cases, they also sell do-it-yourself kits where you can add however much nicotine you want. Um, and even though they might contain less nicotine per puff, studies show that uh, vapors tend to puff until they get their nicotine craving, so uh, they tend to take deeper puffs. Also, with a, uh, unlike a cigarette where you have the satisfaction of burning it to the end and putting out the butt, there's no, uh, there's no sense of, OK, I'm done. Uh, so you typically go until you're satisfied. Um, and in addition to that, there's a huge assortment of different flavorings. Uh, they can technically be anything. They're not regulated. Uh, however, I don't think the e-liquid manufacturers are out to intentionally poison its uh, users. So generally, these are additives used in the food industry. Um, and an interesting point is that even though these ingredients are generally acceptable for ingestion, there's very little information that exists on uh, inhalation exposure toxicology. Uh, and then this, uh, this is an example of, uh, uh, it might look like this is a picture taken from an ice cream shop, but in reality, this is taken from a vape shop. Uh, and really, there's an endless list of flavors that are offered. If, if you want to vape tiger's blood, go for it. So it's really endless. 
So briefly, I want to talk about the e-cig market. Uh, depending on what you read, these things hit the market between 2004 and 2007. They started taking off around 2009. And between 2009 and the present, they've approximately tripled their sales every year. Um, the current market is estimated in excess of $2 billion. Uh, the U.S. market is about half of the global market. Um, and many projections put the, uh, say that the e-cig market will surpass the tobacco market in the next uh, five to ten years. Currently, the, the tobacco, global tobacco market is around $100 billion. So right now, this is a drop in the bucket. Uh, but projections say that this could, could really continue to skyrocket. Uh, so the question is, is are we going to look back a decade from now and say, uh, you know, e-cigs, they had a great run. They were popular for a while. Um, but, you know, now they've gone the way of the Rubik's Cube. Um, or are they here to stay? And I don't know the answer to that, but I think a telling sign is the fact that uh, large tobacco companies have taken notice and they've thrown their hats into the ring. Uh, so these are the big three tobacco companies. Uh, uh, Laura Loward, I, I can't pronounce it. Uh, they purchased uh, Blue a few years back, uh, Philip Morris, they launched their own Mark 10, and they also purchased a company, Green Smoke. Um, additionally, RJ Reynolds launched Views recently. Uh, so I think <coughs> these guys are in the market be not to capture the 2% of the tobacco market, but because they think that this is a growing market that's going to be here to stay. How are they marketed? Uh, over this recent six month stretch, uh, there was approximately $39 million spent in the U.S. on e-cig advertising, majority of which is comprised of magazine <coughs> ads, followed by national and local TV, and other media outlets. So how are they advertised? Originally, they were marketed as smoking cessation aids. However, uh, that becomes a, a tricky thing to advertise. Uh, the FDA doesn't regulate these. However, if you are going to claim a medical benefit, if you're going to claim that they can help you to sm uh, quit, then you have to have some proof to back it up. And then that, the ears of the FDA will perk up. Uh, so companies have moved away from advertising as smoking cessation aids. Uh, so instead of trying to help you quit, they have advertisements like this, why quit, switch. Also, they can uh, play to some of the turnoffs that are associated with cigarette smoke, no toxic chemicals, yellow teeth, tar, smelly clothes. Also, they can advertise as being more health conscious. Uh, also, uh, they advertise from the standpoint of you can take back your freedom. Um, you can smoke in place or vape in places where you couldn't smoke. Although this is becoming less and less true as time goes by. And even though federally you can do this anywhere, many cities and states and private institutions have, have uh, adopted their own restrictions. Hopkins Hospital, for example, uh, uh, bans them in their buildings. The FAA uh, bans them on domestic flights. Also, e-cigs aren't subjected to the same taxes that conventional tobacco cigarettes are, and companies are quick to point that out. They're generally cheaper. Uh, also, they're advertised as a luxury item. Um, they use spokesmodels, Jenny McCarthy, for example, and this becomes a glamorous uh, uh, <coughs> option for uh, lifestyle. And so in many ways, we've kind of turned back the clock on tobacco advertising. And the same ads that were used for decades to develop and grow this $100 billion market are now being used all over again with a new wrinkle. So who is using them? Uh, a recent study showed that among their survey participants, about 6.8% of individuals consider themselves current users. However, you can see that this is skewed towards younger adults, 18 to 24 year olds, or twice as likely almost as 25 to 44 year olds to use e-cigs, uh, and that goes down uh, with older generations. Uh, the majority are current smokers, um, and that number has been debated. This study, this is the same study as the first point, uh, put uh, nearly a third of uh, users as either current or former smokers, um, of which 12% were never smokers. 5.8% had not touched an e-cigarette or a, a cigarette in, in greater than five years. 
So that's an interesting little uh, point to make that these individuals quit before e-cigarettes took off and now here they are uh, picking up their nicotine habit again after five years. Um, however, a lot of people on the other side will, will contest this claim and, and they'll quote this re British report which showed that a, a insignificant proportion of never smoking adults will become e-cig users. Uh, so perhaps this depends on uh, which population you, you question, the age demographics, for example. Um, this is a report by the CDC that showed that as of 2011, among the approximately 15 million people in the U.S. who have tried e-cigs, about 2 million are never smokers, 3.5 million are former smokers. So this is a significant number of people who are being introduced or reintroduced into nicotine. Um, I wanted to point out our own survey that's being led by two master students, Fatima and Ifa. Uh, they are going to local vape shops and tobacco shops and uh, uh, surveying e-cig users. And so they asked, have you smoked at least 100 tobacco cigarettes in your lifetime? 7% of them said no. So that's less than five packs of cigarettes in their life. So uh, these, in our case, 7% comprise never smokers. Some other interesting points that are coming out of their uh, survey is if you ask, what's your primary motivation for using e-cigarettes? The most popular response is that as an aid to quit smoking, uh, followed by it's healthier than tobacco cigarettes. But if, uh, and if you follow that question up to see, well, how much have you reduced your tobacco cigarette use since starting? Um, in our case, the majority, 79%, said that they had completely stopped these cigar or, uh, using cigarettes. Uh, that's a really impressive number. Other studies point to much less dramatic effects. Um, many studies say that e-cigarettes are definitely more effective than quitting cold turkey, uh, perhaps similar to the patch or the gum, or maybe slightly more effective, but never, not significantly so. Um, but interestingly, if you ask, um, do you then plan to eventually quit using e-cigs, the most popular response is no. So uh, while most people are using these as an aid to quit and many are successfully quitting, they're continuing to use e-cigs. So I think the advertising that's being employed is working. One other point that's uh, being raised is marketing to children. And so while the advertisements that I mentioned, none of those are directly advertising to children, uh, it's undeniable that there are a lot of uh, bright colors, there are a lot of uh, fruity and sweet flavors that certainly are going to be attractive for kids, uh, or really anybody for that matter. I, I like pancakes, so, uh, <laughs> so you know, who knows. But, but it is an alarming uh, trend. If you look at this report by the CDC, um, it shows that teens have Oh, between 2011 and 2012, uh, they've doubled their usage. So this is the number or percentage of teens who have tried e-cigarettes. Uh, the graph on the right shows uh, who, have, have, who has recently used e-cigarettes within the past 30 days. So these trends are, are ticking up. Uh, it's notable that of those teens who have tried e-cigarettes, 77% of them have also tried conventional tobacco products, but that means that 22% of these teens have never tried any conventional tobacco product but are still trying e-cigarettes. Um, other more recent studies, I'm sorry I didn't uh, put the reference, but a study out of Hawaii and out of Colorado suggested that the percentage of teens who have used e-cigs are perhaps even higher than this, uh, this CDC report. One put it at 25%, one put it at 29%. However, it's not clear how many of those teens who try e-cigs go on to uh, use them habitually, and then how many of those go on to transition to tobacco. Currently, 40 of the states in the U.S. prohibit sales to minors. Maryland's one of them. Um, however, 10 states have no age restrictions, and there's 16 million teens or minors in, in those states. So here's, uh, I guess, the, the heart of the public health debate. Uh, according to this Harvard Business Review article, about 3 million individuals in the U.S. as of 2011 have switched from tobacco to e-cigs. However, that's offset by about a million former and never smokers who have taken up e-cigs and then moved on to tobacco. So questions next are, uh, are e-cigs safe or at least safer? 
Uh, the answers might be uh, are likely no and yes, but we'll talk about some of the data and the various methods that have been used to, uh, to uh, determine this. The most popular studies out there are cell-free assays, uh, chemical analyses, so uh, mass spec, HPLC-based methods that just look what's in the liquids, what's in the vapors, and a, a large number of different chemicals have been found. Particulates, formaldehyde, nitrosamines, metals, carbonyls, VOCs, PAHs. Um, and there's, here's one example of a study at the bottom um, looking at vapors of e-cigs. So they looked at a handful of volatile organic compounds as well as two uh, carcinogenic nitro nitrosamines. And they detected uh, levels of, of all of these chemicals in e-cig puffs. However, when they compared it to previous study of conventional cigarette smoke, uh, they draw the conclusion that these levels are one to two orders of magnitude lower than what you would find in a cigarette. Um, however, as you can imagine, if you have a number of different labs using a number of different techniques, testing hundreds of different e-liquids that all use different vape devices. Some are reporting the concentrations in the liquid. Some are reporting them in the vapor. It, the numbers are all over the place. And there's certainly several studies that show that some toxicant levels can be at or above levels seen in cigarettes. Uh, we did our own analysis. Uh, uh, at the time, there was no study on the number of free radicals in e-cig. Uh, vapors. So we puffed some e-cigs. Uh, we did this in collaboration with um, a group at LSU uh, using electron paramagnetic resonance. Uh, they determined that there were 7 times 10 to the 11th free radicals per puff. And this is surprising because the conventional wisdom that was that in order to generate free radicals, you need combustion. And since there's, there's no combustion, there's no free radicals. Uh, but in fact, there's a large number of free radicals. And free radicals are highly reactive. They bind to DNA, proteins, lipids. They modify them. They can damage them. Um, so certainly, this is a large number. By comparison, the generally reported numbers for free radicals per puff of a cigarette are about 1 times 10 to the 14th. So again, this is two orders of magnitude below what you would see in a cigarette. But still, they're there, and they're capable of causing harm. Um, also looking at reactive oxygen species by a different group that came out shortly after our paper. Um, they puffed either blue e-cigs on the left or different, uh, they vaped different liquids on the right. Uh, so regardless of what they vaped, either e-liquids or just pure propylene glycol, glycerin, uh, two different uh, tobacco flavored e-liquids with or without nicotine, they all produced uh, significant reactive oxygen species, which again bind to the same macromolecules and can cause damage. Uh, but an interesting point is that just dry vaping the heating element alone can produce reactive oxygen species and I'll come back to that for a minute. So what are the potential sources of contaminants? Uh, so there are many toxic compounds that have been associated with specific flavors. I list a few. Um, also impurities. There's no good manufacturing practices in uh, generating these e-liquids, or at least no standards. Um, and so, uh, so an example that I list here is that manufacturing of propylene glycol uh, an offshoot of that is production of diethylene glycol, and some liquids have been shown to contain uh, diethylene glycol. <laughs> There's degradation products. Over time, nicotine and other ingredients can degrade, producing some toxic compounds. Um, also, the heating element, the atomizer itself, can be a source of, uh, of contaminants. Uh, the aerosols contain various metals that can leach off of the heating coil. Uh, off the soldering joints, off of any other metals that are contained in the e-cigs. Also, the silica particles uh, can leach off of the wick. Um, and this study here uh, that I highlight showed nine different metals at concentrations in the vapors that were at or <coughs> higher to concentrations found in cigarette smoke. Uh, lastly, pyrolysis. So heat can do a lot of chemistry. For example, if you take propylene glycol, and uh, add heat, you can get a variety of VOCs such as acrolein, formaldehyde, etc. Uh, and, and here's a, an example illustrating that point that if, you, depending on the voltage of the battery that's used to vape, you can get increasing concentrations of various toxicants in the vapors. So uh, voltage is very important in producing uh, various toxicants. 
Uh, here's a second study that kind of supported this uh, uh, first study. This was published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine. Again, showing on the right, shoot, on the right that if you uh, vape at low voltage, three volts, you had no detectable formaldehyde hemiacetals, whereas if you vape at five volts, you have a huge level of formaldehyde releasing agents, such as these formaldehyde hemiacetals, um, much higher than what you would expect to find in a pack of cigarettes. Um, and so this study has been, uh, I guess, criticized by a lot of vapors who say that uh, 5 volts is a very high voltage, that at that level you're going to be produ producing a burning flavor that's not very pleasant. However, the mod devices do go up to 5 or 6 volts, so uh, certainly you could uh, vape at this level, but uh, generally people say that this, this isn't a pleasant experience. Um, so quickly just fly through this. Uh, 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 we'll move on to cell cytotoxicity. So there's a, a variety of in vitro assays. Here's one example, um, and I like this one from the standpoint that they looked at three different cell lines and tested 36 different e-liquids, and they just put the liquids in, on the cells in various concentrations and came up with a dose that killed half of the cells in 24 hours. And so they observed several of the liquids were non-cytotoxic, uh, some were moderately cytotoxic, and the one at the bottom right was highly cytotoxic. Uh, this is cinnamon uh, flavor. And uh, uh, so it, it's interesting. This, this brings up the fact that while this is a very artificial system, just pouring liquids on cells, it does show that, that what's in the flavorings matters. Um, and in fact, they, uh, they, this group did a follow-up study where they uh, took cinnamon e-liquids from a variety of different manufacturers, and they showed that most of those were highly cytotoxic, and that toxicity correlated with concentrations of cinnamaldehyde in the liquids. Um, however, these, this study did not make any comparisons to relative toxicity to cigarette smoke. Uh, so here's a more recent study that did compare toxicity versus cigarette smoke extract. Uh, they showed that while 2.5% e-liquids had very minimal or no cytotoxicity compared to the control, 1% um, cigarette smoke extract was much more cytotoxic. Uh, however, it, it should be noted that cigarette smoke extract is generated by puffing a cigarette, collecting it on a vapor, using some solvent to get it off of the, the filter. So it's very different than taking a liquid out of the bottle and comparing the, to the toxicity. So it's a bit of apples and oranges. But, uh, <laughs> But uh, for sure, there are some differences, uh, suggesting that cigarette smoke extract is uh, more cytotoxic. Uh, if you compare that to just uh, to exposing to the vapor, however, rather than just the liquids, you can see here that vaping for 5, 10, 15 minutes produces significant increases in cytokines, IL-8, IL-6, whereas by comparison at the bottom, just adding the liquids, with the exception of cinnamon flavor, adding the liquids alone caused no significant increases in IL-8. So this suggests that what's in the liquids and what's in the vapor are not uh, always the same thing. So. Uh, we'll move on to a few mouse studies, of which uh, we have published one of them. Uh, the first study tested the effects of e-liquids on asthma uh, in mice. And so, again, these, th this group used a solution of e-liquids, 2% solution that they instilled into the nose, uh, and they did that twice a week for 10 weeks. And then they put these mice through uh, an animal model of asthma in which they sensitized and challenged with uh, an allergen. And so the, the line chart shows the asthmatic response, the airway hyperresponsiveness, which is the most uh, uh, central phenotype associated with asthma. So the asthmatic mice alone had some response which was slightly elevated among those mice that were pre-exposed to uh, e-liquids. Uh, if you looked at eosinophilic inflammation, Th2 cytokines, IgE levels, these are all hallmarks of the asthmatic response, uh, and they were all elevated in those mice that have been dosed with e-liquids. But again, this is not an actual exposure, so you take it with a bit of salt. So this is where we jumped in, and uh, we did. We wanted to establish a, a, an animal exposure model. Uh, and so we used a cigarette smoke machine that we modified for use with e-cigarettes. So this machine took a puff of an e-cigarette once every 10 seconds. It took a two-second puff, 
and then that air was mixed in with dilution air and pumped into a small chamber where the mouse lived for three hours a day. And so at the end of that, we, we uh, separated the mice into three different groups. Some of them we measured the effects right after this two-week exposure. And the other two groups, we gave an intranasal infection with either a bacterium or a virus to look at the response. So first, just looking at the mice that were exposed to uh, uh, e-cigs alone, we saw an increase in oxidative stress on the left, lipid peroxidation, that's a mod an oxidatively modified lipid, um, so indicator of reactive <coughs> oxygen species, oxidative stress. Uh, we also looked at inflammation and saw a mild increase in the number of macrophages that were being recruited into the airway. Uh, but what was most compelling was when we added the bacterial infection after the last exposure. And, and we waited, this was strep pneumonia that we gave them, and uh, we waited 24 hours and then we looked how many viable bacteria are still in the, in, either in the airway in B or in the lungs in C uh, after 24 hours. And, uh, so the e-cig exposed mice had significant increases in the number of bacteria that were still in the lungs at, at, after 24 hours. Uh, and so the question that we had then is, is this because the, the inflammatory cells are not being pro properly recruited or is this because they're getting there but once they're there they're not functional? So we did an ex vivo assay where we, we pulled the macrophages out of the airway prior to the infection and did the infection in a culture dish. Uh, so we infected uh, the macrophages at either 10 bacteria per macrophage or 20 bacteria per macrophage and looked after several hours to see how many viable bacteria were still in the dish. Uh, and so it turned out that e-cig exposed or macrophages from e-cig exposed mice had significantly more bacteria that, that were uh, s still present. Uh, to further that, we looked at how many bacteria are inside the macrophages versus outside the macrophages. Uh, and what we saw is that there were significantly fewer macrophages inside the macrophages, suggesting that the macrophages are less able to take up the bacteria uh, and, and, and deal with the infection. Uh, to, uh, of note, we, we predominantly focused on menthol e-cigarettes for no particular reason, but as proof of principle, we also did some parallel experiments with traditional tobacco flavors to show that it was not specific to <coughs> menthol. Uh, the last experiment, or set of experiments that we did was look at the response to viral infections. So after the last exposure, we gave them an intranasal viral infection, and at that point we didn't expose them to e-cigs anymore, um, and we just monitored them carefully for the next two weeks. And so what we saw is that around day four or five, they began to show signs of illness, they began to lose weight, at that point, at day four, we harvested a subset of these mice and looked at the, um, at the viral titers, saw that they were significantly elevated in the mice that were exposed to e-cigs, uh, and then we continued to monitor them. At first, we didn't see any differences in their weight loss. Uh, uh, however, once they hit their peak around day nine, that's when we started to see the mice uh, separating themselves. The air mice began to recover more quickly. The e-cig exposed mice, and keep in mind these haven't been exposed now for, uh, since prior to the infection, um, but the resolution of the illness was uh, significantly worse among those mice that were previously exposed to e-cigs. And when we, uh, and in fact, we didn't see any death in the air exposed mice. However, 20% of the e-cig exposed mice did die as a result of this infection, which is shown uh, here. Um, and so we were, we were intrigued by that, so I'll skip this for now, but uh, um, we were intrigued by that and so we gave, we followed this up by giving a higher infectious dose. Uh, and when we did that, again, the mice became sick, this time more quickly, but their initial weight loss was similar between the two groups. However, again, once they hit that peak uh, illness is when we started to see this difference, uh, differences in weight. Um, as well as differences in mortality. 30% of the air exposed mice died compared to 60% of the e-cig uh, e exposed mice. Uh, so clearly these mice had reductions in their uh, uh, antiviral and antibacterial immune responses. Uh, this is a study led, uh, done here at Hopkins, led by Sharon McGrath, Morrow, Enid, um, in which they exposed mice uh, that were born within the uh, neonatal mice, so mice that were born within 24 hours received their first exposure to e-cigs, 
and they were exposed for, I think, 40 minutes a day for the first 10 days of their life. That resulted in significant reductions in weight gain over time, altered uh, lung maturation. Uh, in the case of the mice that were exposed to nicotine-containing e-cigs, uh, they had a reduction in KI-67, which is a marker of cell proliferation. So this suggests that, uh, that early life exposure to e-cigs can alter proper tissue and organ uh, development as well as overall uh, development. Uh, and many, uh, the effects of nicotine are well known uh, to be very toxic to developing fetus or, or newborns. Uh, so, and this supports that. So lastly, uh, there's a few human studies not many. Um, this first one that I bring up, this, these are two studies done by the same group. Uh, the top abstract looks at the immediate response to a single five-minute dosing or vaping of, of an e-cigarette. Uh, the bottom abstract looks at the immediate response to a single cigarette. Uh, and I put these side by side because they, the, both of them show almost identical uh, responses. Uh, they show immediate increases in respiratory resistance and impedance, as well as decrease in exhaled nitric oxide. Um, however, this is countered by two other studies that suggest that perhaps there aren't any or minimal ac acute effects of e-cigs. Um, so this first study compared brief use of e-cigs versus cigarettes and saw while using an, a, a cigarette reduced your lung function by 7.2%, which was significant. Um, E-cig use uh, acutely did not have a significant impact on lung function, a 3% drop, but not significantly. That same study showed that while using a cigarette, uh, that increased your blood leukocyte levels, but uh, that same effect was not seen in, with E-cig use. A second presentation that was given at a conference showed that e-cigs had minimal effects on acute cardiac function, uh, whereas cigarette smoke resulted in increases in systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, heart rate. Uh, e-cigs had minimal effects and only had any change on diastolic pressure. Uh, chronic effects, there's, there's very little. Um, however, one thing that uh, is, is uh, used as a parallel uh, is, is exposure to theatrical fog machines. There are many studies that show that, uh, for example, stagehands who work in close proximity to a fog machine have lower lung function than those stagehands who work at a larger, longer proximity from, uh, from, from the uh, fog machines. Same, similar studies have been done with actors. Um, and there's a variety of acute and chronic respiratory issues that are associated with exposure to fog machines. And in fact, there are guidelines uh, for, for exposures uh, to fog machines. This is the last data slide that I have, um, which shows that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a small study, but it, it's very interesting, and so I'll take a minute to explain it. Um, they show, this is a study of adult asthmatics who were smokers, who switched to e-cigarettes. And so they either switched entirely, in the case of single users, there are 10 individuals who switched entirely to e-cigarettes, went from smoking a pack a day down to nothing, or another group that switched from, that took up e-cigarettes and cut back their smoking from a pack a day to about four or five cigarettes a day. And so these, uh, they did uh, six month and 12 month follow-ups on lung function measurements and asthmatic response. Uh, and so if you just focus on the single users, uh, improvement at 12 months of lung function, uh, reduction in the asthma uh, control index, um, improvement in the airway hyperresponsiveness. Uh, so there, this is not a placebo-controlled trial. This is a very small sample size, but uh, it suggests that uh, there is some potential for harm reduction with e-cigs. Um, so, just to summarize the, the human studies, um, there are many studies or a few studies that show at least some acute response. Um, several of those responses are reported to be a bit milder than smoking. Um, uh, and clearly there is some room for, uh, for improvement, for harm reduction. However, I put this picture here uh, of a smoker's lungs, I think the bar is so low when it comes to can you improve from cigarette smoke. We, we know that cigarette smoke is just awful for you. Um, so it's, it's unlikely that an e-cigarette can do this to your lungs. Um, so 
so certainly there, it, the bar is very low when it comes to can you uh, can these be more beneficial than than cigarettes. Uh, so it seems as if that could be the case. Uh, it's early to tell, but uh, but you know uh, I would put my you know if I were betting on it I would bet on it. Uh, but uh, um, but that doesn't mean that these are without harm. And I think it's pretty obvious that that studies show that that there is some harm. Uh, and one last thing that can't really be ignored. This is again coming out of of our survey. If you ask the e-cig users, have you noticed a, a change in your health since switching to e-cigs, 90% of them say yes. And uh, so I can't say that they're lying. Uh, uh, who am I to say they're wrong? So uh, there's certainly a perception among the users that they feel healthier. Um, and so it's anecdotal, but, uh, but I think the, it's overwhelming. Uh, lastly, uh, just whiz past this, uh, FDA does not regulate e-cigs, but about a year ago they issued a proposal that they will begin to uh, regulate them as tobacco products, which gives them the authority to regulate them in the same way that any other conventional tobacco product is, so they can put age restrictions, uh, they can require scientific review of any new products or claims that are made by the uh, companies. Um, and so. If this is finalized, and right now it's in the proposal stage, if this is finalized, it would require tobacco company or uh, e-cig companies to submit a proposal or an application for every product that they put onto the market. So every flavor, every vape device, um, and, and this is retroactive back to 2007. So pretty much anything is going to be subject to, to this application. Each application would re require thousands of hours and $300,000 a piece. So this would pretty much put those mom and pop vape shops out of business, um, which would be to the delight of the big tobacco companies. Uh, so lastly, conclusion. Um, so e-cigs contain, no doubt e-cigs contain nicotine. Uh, they no doubt pose some acute and chronic health risks. Um, certainly there's room where e-cigs be could become less harmful. And so I think regulation should, should try to, as much as possible, make them as less harmful as possible. Some of these seem pretty easy and no-brainers. Um, however, regardless of how many regulatory measures you put into place, they're never going to be harmless. There's always going to be risk associated with using them. Um, and while e-cigs are likely less harmful than tobacco cigarettes, we don't know how harmful they are, but on the continuum, they're somewhere between zero and tobacco. Uh, so, um, uh, and lastly, I think e-cigarettes, they're not promoting uh, smoking cessation. Instead, they're promoting you to switch and use their products, uh, which can promote relapse of former smokers and initiation of never smokers uh, to nicotine. So I, I think the goal for regulation should be how do you target those individuals who are smokers and vapors and uh, avoid targeting those, uh, those people who are not smokers or vapors. Uh, and I stole this idea from this review here at the bottom um, that, uh, that suggested perhaps direct communications to verified smokers or vapors might be a way to, to limit uh, advertising, as well as regu uh, federal regulations to prohibit sale to minors. That, that's a no-brainer. Uh, they already can't purchase tobacco products, but they can purchase uh, e cigs uh, So with that, uh, that's it for me. So just want to thank those people involved in our studies, uh, the animal experiments on the left. I've worked with Sean Biswell now for almost a decade. Uh, Yang did the actual exposures. Uh, Sachin was my right-hand man with most of the experiments, and then a variety of others who helped in varying capacities. What about the cost differential? I mean, what is, if you were to compare some of these, say, cigarette use, or say a pack a day versus e-cigarettes, what's the cost difference? Purely economical? Uh, well, I don't buy either, so what, what is the cost? I mean, difference? obviously I have no idea. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't tell you how much a pack of cigarettes goes for these days. Uh, $7. Uh, the liquids, you can buy a 10 milliliter bottle of that liquid for probably 10 bucks. And I, I think 
I think on average, use of average user maybe uses a few mils a day. So I think one bottle would last you a, a few days. But you uh, reuse the the the, uh, the the device. You can reuse. Um, those are on the neighborhood of twenty bucks up to probably a hundred bucks, depending on how nice they are. Um, and I guess those artistic ones could go above that, but. Most of them are, are in the, I would say, $50 range. And that's, that's a one-time purchase. Um, they, some of them, I, I guess, uh, if, if you like to mix and match different flavors, perhaps you would like to be able to remove the tank and replace it. Some of them offer re removable tanks um, so that you're not kind of muddying your, uh, your flavors as you move on to the next flavor. Uh, so there are some purchases. Uh, a lot of people like to tinker with the wicks or the uh, or the heating coils, which I, I, I believe over time can can burn out. Yes. Thank you for taking up my presentation. One question uh, that I had in regards to one of your early slides about the uh, the free radical exposure. Mm -hmm. um, I realized that it was about uh, I guess you said. Uh, uh, Right. Less than, than uh, smoking. But one thing that I'd be interested in comparing it to is how does the amount of free radical exposure compare to, say, an urban environment? Great you question. I, I think in the highly polluted areas, uh, Baltimore, urban. Uh, Baltimore uh, I, I think that the levels are closer to what you would see in a cigarette than what you would see in an e-cigarette. Uh, uh, that was a question that I asked our collaborators around the time that our paper came out, and that was the response that I got, that a very polluted day, you can get concentrations of free radicals that can approach that of, of cigarettes. Yeah. So how popular are they in other countries? I, 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 I think the U.S. makes up about half of the global market, so they are, they, these were invented in China, uh, and, um, but uh, I, think, I think this is a global phenomenon. When I was in India a year ago, I asked around how many people are using e-cigs. I couldn't find them. Um, uh, but I think they're, they're continuing to expand everywhere. Um, as far as regulations go, there are some countries that have banned them. Uh, some countries have taken a hands-off approach. Um, very few of them, relatively few of them, have banned them outright. Um, I don't know if, if other countries have sales or restrictions to minors. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. Joanna, do you know? You know we have been working on this. Institute, and we have a report on our website, mm -hmm. um, you can take a look at what we are finding from all these countries. Very many countries are using different approaches to approach um, regulation of e-cigarettes, and new regulations are coming up in a few months, two years, mm -hmm. so we have a look at it. Okay. Can you say the website again? GlobalTobaccoControl.org. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I noticed that in your conclusions, you mentioned on the FDA's role in developing policies, and you said it's important. They make a distinction between um, current smokers and um, people who vape, and then um, new users who just vape. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I'm concerned about that because there are, um, there are schools of thought that think that um, when um, people, young people that just vape, they can become um, independence and then from then they move on to smoking. So um, what I want to talk about that. Well yeah, yeah uh, I, I th for sure th for, sorry for sure there is that concern. Um, I, I think it's difficult to say at this point how many of those are doing that. Uh, I think it would be interesting to look 10 years down the road how many of those have transitioned to tobacco. I, that data is not there as far as I know. Um, but nicotine is highly addictive. Um, there was a Lancet paper that came out a year or two ago showing that um, 
that users of the patch had perhaps a, a five or six percent success rate of, of completely uh, quitting cigarettes for after six months, whereas e-cig users were um, maybe around seven percent. So regardless of how you slice it, nicotine is highly addictive and none of these uh, approaches are very effective. Most smokers try to quit many times. So, so there's no denying that there's an addictive uh, nature to, to nicotine. So once you, you become addicted, whether it's e-cigarettes or cigarettes, uh, uh, I think there's a real risk that, that you could switch. Mark. Um, so I guess regarding the, the free radical exposure, I mean, there's obviously a lot of different types of free radicals, some which may be more reactive than others. Have you or your collaborators actually profiled what some of those actually are and maybe compared to e-cig exposure to cigarette smoke or anything like that? I have not. Uh, uh, our study was just simply counts, uh, not looking at what they are. Uh, there is a, a very recent paper that came out um, that did attempt to categorize the e-cigs, although I don't off the top of my head, I can't tell you, but there is one new study that came out about um, earlier this month, uh, and in March, I think it came out, so, um, uh, which is beginning, which made some general statements as to what type of, of oxidants are there, uh, all in a cell-free chemical uh, analysis, but I, I can't tell you off the top of my head what they are, but we have, have not done any of that. This was kind of an add-on to our mouse study. Uh, we just thought, we, we saw what was coming out and saw one, one lack that, that was obvious to us, having an interest in oxidative stress. Uh, where's all the oxidative stress data? And so we thought, well, we're not, we're not uh, capable of doing this ourselves, so let's reach out to somebody and see if we can't get it done. So it was kind of a, an add-in to an otherwise mouse ex uh, experiment. So, but I don't know. What about the other nicotine effects of vasoconstriction as an example? Do you think it's an issue here? Yeah, uh, I, I think so. I think uh, Enid's uh, study, Sharon's study, showed that, that nicotine itself has tremendous effects. There are a lot of studies looking at just nicotine alone in rodent models. Uh, the nicotine does a lot of, of harm, particularly to to younger individuals, fetuses, developing newborns, uh, nicotine has tremendous uh, detrimental effects. Uh, a lot of brain issues related to nicotine exposure. Uh, so I think nicotine alone, and in fact, I didn't say this, but um, I suspect that a lot of the issues that I saw in my study um, with bacterial infections had to do with immunosuppressive effects of nicotine. The, the, it's funny, most of the papers have been comparing to cigarette smoke, whereas the, for public health uh, uh, for professionals, I think we should be comparing to air. So, so <coughs> the theory that you said is a little greater than the, it's less toxic mm -hmm. than the really, really toxic you know, cigarette smoke, but we should be comparing to air, to nothing. Because right. that's what the new people are going to be exposed. Right. Uh, I've developed thick skin over the last couple months uh, <laughs> because uh, having published a paper in PLOS One, uh, that, that paper got picked up by every media outlet that I can think of. And it's a freely accessible journal. Anyone can click on it. My email is right there. Uh, so I, I get, God, I get bombarded. Plus, on top of that, you can write in your own comments on the actual journal's website. So I just get killed for that. Uh, for, we didn't make any direct comparisons to cigarette smoke. Uh, in reality, we, we tried to do a little bit. But in the end, it, it seemed a little bit of our comparisons I didn't feel were, were fair. Uh, they were apples and oranges a little bit. This was exposed a little bit longer than this. or you know. So in the end, I didn't feel it was fair to make those, any comparisons to cigarettes. But, but I agreed with you. I thought, well, we can just sell it a, as, a, as a public health issue alone. Uh, but the problem is that the people who feel very passionately about this issue are often people who are smokers who are using this for a specific purpose. And now you're telling them that that purpose is not valid. So they're the people who are very quick to just kill you on it. <laughs>
Um, so I have a question sort of to add on that. Um, I'm wondering if you have um, ideas for like future work or research that would um, like further contextualize this issue. Um, so I understand from your presentation, um, you know, what the risks and harms are of, of the, the paper and the products and um, sort of on a greater scale where like in the right dose or circumstances anything can be toxic for you, like aspirin or like we have a big prescription sure. drug abuse epidemic. Um, how do we move this forward to um, put into context um, like whether these can be used as a harm reduction tool or whether they will just um, further facilitate smoking and looking at regulations without um, sort of diminishing some of the possible benefits we could get. I, I think that's a, that's a very tricky question and that's why that's why this is a you know a, a full room, not because uh, you're all my friends. And, you know, <laughs> I like you all, but uh, but, but you know I, I think people feel very passionately on both sides, and, and there are valid arguments on both sides that uh, uh, there is some room for benefit, uh, but these aren't harmless, and I think anyone who says that they are are fooling themselves. Um, uh, but like you said, anything in in a dose is uh, is is harmful, but I think. In the doses that, that most people are using e-cigs, there is some harm. Um, so uh, uh, I, I think that's a difficult issue. Um, and I, I think that's something that we're going to wrestle with for, for quite a while. Um, I really don't know how to. It, it, it's, it's not an easy answer. Uh, so I really don't know what to tell you. but. Uh, um, I think more realistic exposures, and, and even my exposure has been uh, criticized. There's a, 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 again, I have thick skin, but uh, uh, is, is the dose of nicotine that my mice received, is, is the dose of, of e-cig vapor that, that her exposure uh, did, are those realistic? And, and uh, I've had many people who know much more about dosing toxicology uh, Take, you know, lecture me on, on how flawed my experiments were. So uh, it, it's a tricky, tricky question. Um, yeah, I saw some of the comments. <laughs> and, it's, and if any of you thought that gun rights people were harsh, you should see Um I was wondering, because um, you, uh, you must have thought a lot about this, because there's so many products in the market. When you were trying to design your experiment to choose the solutions that you would actually use, what kind of criteria do you use to make sure that you are actually getting the percentages, et cetera, that you would need in order to draw conclusions? And this, the second part of it, it also has to do with kind of how you guys thought about it, is that if you were going to design this to look at some of the flavorings, how would you do that given that there are hundreds of these things that are coming on the market? And is there a rational way that you could actually look at the inhalational toxicity or something? Uh, I, I think, so your first question, how did we decide on, on ours? Uh, I think as much as anything it was logistical issues, we had an, a, a cigarette smoke machine that was designed to smoke cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And so we were restricted from that standpoint to choose cig likes that were of the approximate size of a cigarette that could be f e relatively easily fit into our machine. So, uh, and, and then beyond that, we chose at the time, we, we started our study now uh, probably two years ago, um, uh, we, we chose a brand that was one of the most popular at the time, Enjoy. Uh, now they've kind of faded a bit. Um, and so again, I've been killed for that reason as well, that we didn't choose the most popular e-cigarette. Um, and at the time, they sold two flavors, tobacco, menthol. We thought, well, menthol might have more flavorings in it, so, so perhaps more complex, so let's add menthol. Just, you know, if we're going to see an effect, let's, let's try to just add a flavor, and we had two options. So. Um, so that was what kind of guided our philosophies, but uh, I've seen new grants or RFAs coming out that suggest that you should develop a reference e-cigarette. When we do cigarette smoke studies, everyone's supposed to use a reference cigarette so that we're all on the same playing field, but how do you choose a reference e-cigarette? Um, every bit of it is, is so highly variable. There's hundreds of flavors. There's uh, 
any range of nicotine. You can you can add any combination of bases. That I can't see. And, and if you do choose a single e-cigarette to represent everything, then I think you're missing the boat. Uh, you're going to miss out on a lot of stuff. So it's. I think I'm. I think we're kind of stuck with uh, with I do it in this and you do it in that, and maybe we'll get the same thing. Uh, it, it's a difficult question. And the flavorings. Uh, the most popular flavors are tobacco flavors, um, uh, at, because most are, are, are ex-smokers or, or current smokers, so I think those are the most popular flavors. Um, but the toxicity studies tend to show that the sweeter flavors are more toxic. So uh, the cinnamon was the most, but the sweeter ones tend to be most toxic. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a policy related question. So from what we're getting from your study and other studies that look at um, the second hand impact of aerosols, e-spray aerosols or vapors, um, how harmful are, are they in terms of the public health context? For example, some countries like Japan are choosing not to include e-cigarettes in their smoke-free um, bans because there is no evidence that they are harmful on the public um, health uh, uh, perspective. And some other countries say no, we want to play it safe until there's evidence that they're not harmful. Right. Uh, I, I think most uh, health organizations, their official statement is that the burden of proof should be on the manufacturer, not on the public. Um, as far as is there a potential for secondhand exposure, uh, uh, I've seen studies that say that e-cig vapor stays suspended in the air for on the order of 10 seconds or so. In my personal experience, just playing around with them, they seem to stay suspended considerably longer than that. Um, uh, but certainly that's long enough for me to take a puff and, and puff it out and expose Joanna. Um, however, by comparison, uh, cigarette smoke stays in the air for on the order of minutes. Um, but it's not just how long does it stay in the air. Nicotine can be absorbed through the skin. Um, so uh, there are other ways. There's third-hand exposure, essentially. You know, if, if you go into a hotel room, you can immediately tell if the previous occupant was a smoker. Uh, so that person hadn't smoked there for a day or two, but there's, there's this... It's not what's lingering in the air, it's what's coating everything. And I think that's yet another exposure that, uh, that even if, if, it, if the vapor condenses and cools and, and goes back to a liquid, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not getting exposed. So, uh, so I think th there's not a lot that's, that's known, but I think there's certainly there's that risk, and I, I bet that there, there is some harm associated with it. I think we're out of time. Dr. Slesson might be able to stay for a few minutes if you have any other questions. Just to repeat what Io said, we do have a policy scan of over 170 countries of what countries around the world are doing around uh, e-cigarette policies. Obviously, um, it changes on a, a daily or weekly basis, but you can find it on globaltobaccocontrol.org. Um, so thank you for just a terrific talk and covering a lot of ground and answering um, a broad range of questions. So thanks very much for sharing this. Thank you. Thank you.